uh, in the room with me here in Olympia at the Natural Resources Building are additional staff from both the Department of Natural Resources and we have from the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Mark Ostwald and Vince Harkey, and they will be able to help answer some questions as time permits. So if you don't get a question answered or you still need more information, feel free to submit a comment and we'll be able to address it when we publish our final environmental impact statement. And I'll talk all about how to submit comments later in the presentation. So this afternoon, I will first be walking you through some background information on both the Department of Natural Resources and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And that background information is going to help you understand our roles in this draft environmental impact statement. And I'll be providing some highlights of the draft itself. Please note that the entire draft environmental impact statement, supporting information, including posters that we presented at four public meetings held around the state earlier this month, and additional tools for you to understand the different alternatives we are exploring are all on DNR's website. We'll be posting this webinar on our website for later viewing, and I'll give you the web address for all of that later on if you don't already have it. So this draft environmental impact statement is a joint effort between the Washington State Department of Natural Resources, or DNR, and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. So our two agencies have worked closely together over the past several years to create alternatives for long-term marble mural conservation on DNR-managed lands. And these are lands in western Washington. We jointly issued our draft environmental impact statement last December, and this DEIS, as we call it, is designed to meet the requirements of both the State Environmental Policy Act, or SEPA, and the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. I'm now going to take a moment to discuss the different roles and responsibilities of each agency involved in this DEIS. So the Department of Natural Resources manages just over 5.5 million acres of land statewide. These lands include lands called trust lands, some of which are forested. Other trust lands that we manage include agricultural lands, aquatic lands, and conservation lands. The long-term strategy for the Marble Neurolet will apply to forested state trust lands managed by DNR in western Washington, about 1.4 million acres of land area. I'll show you a map of this area later on. So there are two groups of state trust lands, granted trust lands and state forest trust lands. Granted trust lands were granted to the state of Washington at the time of our statehood for the purpose of providing revenue for schools. The different granted trust lands beneficiaries are listed along the left side of the slide. State forest trust lands were forest lands that at the time of the Depression last century were abandoned by their owners, leaving counties to manage those lands without receiving property taxes. These lands became such a significant burden for counties, it was decided to move them into state ownership. But the counties were designated as the beneficiaries for revenues generated from these lands. Both granted and state forest trust lands were managed by a number of natural resource agencies until the Department of Natural Resources was formed in 1957. At that point, DNR was given the responsibility to be the trust manager for these lands on behalf of the state of Washington. This pie chart shows the proportion of acres that are in each trust on the west side of Washington state. If you look at this pie chart on DNR's website, it looks slightly different because it includes DNR-managed lands across the entire state. This chart is looking specifically at the 1.4 million acres of land on the west side where our marble muralette strategy would apply. You can see that most of these lands are either in the Common School Trust, which is one of the federally granted lands, or in the State Forest Trusts, where counties are the beneficiaries. Management of these trust lands comes with something we call the trust mandate, which is described briefly here. You'll notice that DNR has a legal fiduciary obligation under the state constitution to generate revenue and other benefits for each trust in perpetuity, as well as maintain undivided loyalty to its beneficiaries. You'll also notice that DNR must act impartially with respect to current and future beneficiaries. These responsibilities form an important backdrop to the conservation strategy I'm going to be describing in this presentation. Decisions about the management of these trust lands are made by the Board of Natural Resources. This board makes all policy decisions for the Department of Natural Resources. As you can see, the board is made up of the Commissioner of Public Lands, as well as a number of representatives for beneficiaries, including the University of Washington, Washington State University, the Superintendent of Public Instruction, a representative for Timber Counties, and a representative for the general public, which is the designee for Governor Jay Inslee. 
This board is the decision-making body that will receive your comments on this draft environmental impact statement, and they will ultimately determine which Muralet conservation alternative to move forward with on DNR-managed lands. The long-term conservation strategy being contemplated by the Board of Natural Resources right now will amend the current way we protect Muralet habitat on state trust lands. DNR manages this habitat under a Habitat Conservation Plan, or HCP, which was adopted in 1997. With this HCP, DNR was able to receive an incidental take permit from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to manage its lands within Muralet habitat because the Muralet is listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. An incidental take permit basically allows DNR to continue its operations in Muralet habitat with a strategy in place to minimize and mitigate impacts to the Muralet to the maximum extent practicable. I'm going to talk more about those permit requirements in a moment. The 1997 Habitat Conservation Plan contains what we refer to as an interim strategy to protect the marble Muralet habitat on DNR managed lands. Meaning in 1997, we knew that we needed more information in order to create a long-term strategy for Muralets. The interim strategy was always envisioned as a temporary strategy and plans were made from the beginning to gather more scientific information about how and where the marble muralette uses DNR managed land. The interim strategy was also fairly complicated to implement and has been the subject of ongoing adjustments and consultations between DNR and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uncertainty has remained about whether muralette conservation is in the right place. So DNR and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have worked together to create options for a long-term strategy, which will be more intentional about where and how marble muralet habitat will be conserved over the next 50 years, bringing certainty to forest management and muralet habitat for DNR, and more predictable outcomes for both agencies. Both agencies are required to do an environmental impact statement for any amendment to the Habitat Conservation Plan and related incidental take permit, so it made a lot of sense to develop our environmental review document together. But our responsibilities do differ, and I want to now talk about how the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and its role in this process works. The marble muralette was listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act in 1992. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service implements the Endangered Species Act, and it issued DNR its incidental take permit in 1997 so the DNR could implement the Habitat Conservation Plan and continuing managing forest lands with muralette habitat. It is important to note that as we move forward to amend our HCP and our associated permit, we aren't changing any of the other pieces of the Habitat Conservation Plan, which has other conservation strategies in place for riparian areas, northern spotted owls, and the habitats of other listed species. In order for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to be able to approve DNR's amended HCP and incidental take permit, the agency must find that DNR has met specific permit issuance criteria, which are listed here. These include that the taking will be incidental and that it will be minimized and mitigated to the maximum extent practicable. We must also have a strategy that will include adequate funding, will not appreciably reduce survival and recovery of the muralette in the wild, and the permit may include additional measures to ensure that the strategy can be successfully implemented. I can't talk any more about a strategy to conserve the marble muralette without first describing some of the basic biology and ecology of this bird. On this slide, you'll see the bird on the left and it is in its summer breeding plumage. And on the right is how the murelet looks this time of year in winter plumage. The marble murelet spends most of its life at sea, feeding on small fish. But from April through September, it flies up to 55 miles inland to nest in mature and old growth forests. I'll talk more about their nesting habits in a moment. The range of the murelet runs from the tip of Alaska down through California. Their marine populations are closely associated with coastal forests in the summertime because that is where they nest. The marble murelet flies inland from marine waters to seek out a large moss-covered branch of a mature tree on which to lay a single egg. In Washington, these nesting platforms are found primarily in western hemlock and Douglas fir trees. The murelet, again, does not build a nest, but it lays an egg on one of these natural platforms. Once their egg is hatched, they take turns feeding their chick, flying in from the sea at dawn and dusk. They are tricky to observe in the wild, and a few actual nests have been found. Survey work relies on observing nesting behaviors, such as birds flying low through the forest canopy to identify areas 
where they are nesting. As I mentioned earlier, the marble murrelet was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1992 for Washington. Their populations are also listed in British Columbia under Canada's species protection law. Alaska populations have declined but are not listed as threatened or endangered. A major threat to the murrelet has been the loss of nesting habitat from logging and development over the past 150 years. In more recent years, it has become clear that predation on eggs and chicks by corvids, which are birds like stellars, jays, and ravens, is a threat to murrelet survival. Threats in the marine environment also abound, including changing marine conditions that affect prey availability. Marine predators, oil spills, and gillnets have also taken their toll. So the long-term strategy we are talking about today is designed to address these threats that affect just the inland nesting habitat of DNR managed lands. The strategy will apply within this green area shown on the slide on the map to the right, which represents that 55-mile inland range of the murrelet that I talked about. This area is referred to as the analysis area in the DEIS, and it covers the 1.4 million acres of DNR managed trust lands we've been discussing. The strategy will not apply to private lands or federal lands in this area. These lands are not governed by DNR's habitat conservation plan. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and DNR work together to develop a set of objectives for a long-term strategy. These objectives were approved by the Board of Natural Resources and guided the development of the alternatives that are analyzed in the draft environmental impact statement. All of the objectives, as well as the guiding purpose and need statements for the strategy are described in Chapter 1 of the DEIS, and I encourage everyone to read through them. This slide is just a shorthand list, but it gives a sense of the rather complex scope of what the alternatives are designed to address. These are not simple objectives. They require us to ensure that continued revenue will be generated from state trust lands for those beneficiaries I pointed out earlier, while DNR strategically and sustainably manages those lands in order to minimize and mitigate the take of murrelet. The range and complexity of the alternatives considered in the DEIS reflects the influence of these multiple objectives. There are six alternative strategies developed and analyzed in this DEIS. There is no preferred alternative at this point. We are interested in getting comments on all of these options. The first, alternative A, is considered our no action alternative. The no action alternative represents the interim strategy I explained and that DNR now implements under the Habitat Conservation Plan. Five action alternatives, which we call alternatives B, C, D, E, and F, propose different amounts and locations of new murrelet habitat conservation and different conservation measures that will guide DNR's forest management activities and land uses within and near murrelet habitat. The action alternatives were developed jointly by DNR and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service using all of the available information we have about DNR's forest lands, the murrelet habitat within these forests, current science about marble murrelet populations and their nesting requirements, and keeping the objectives you just saw in mind. This took a significant amount of work and time and considered previous public input from an extended scoping process. Now we have a range of alternatives that can be examined for potential environmental impacts, which is the purpose of the draft environmental impact statement. It's important to understand that DNR already protects approximately 583,000 acres of land within the analysis area I showed you for multiple conservation objectives, including protecting murrelet habitat, but also including protection of old growth forests, sensitive riparian and natural areas, spotted owl habitat, and other sensitive places. That existing level of conservation is not changing under any of the alternatives proposed. What the five action alternatives do is add 10 to 151,000 acres of marbled murrelet habitat conservation to this existing base of conservation. We identified areas important for marbled murrelet conservation using a habitat model called P-Stage, which you can read all about in the DEIS, but which basically uses DNR's forest inventory information to identify areas with the highest potential for use by the marbled murrelet for nesting. These new acres of marble murrelet conservation can be categorized into different types of conservation areas, which come with their own sets of proposed rules, which we call conservation measures, which describe what DNR can or cannot do within these areas. 
Each alternative has a different mix of these conservation areas and associated conservation measures. All of the alternatives would continue to protect occupied sites, which are the areas of the forest and they're between 5 and 3,100 acres in size that survey work has identified as used by murrelets for nesting. Occupied sites are our highest value habitat areas when we apply that P stage model I was talking about. The action alternatives all include more occupied sites than are currently protected under the interim strategy because we've done more work since 1997 to identify these areas. Now I'm going to describe all of the other types of conservation areas you can see listed on these slides. All of the alternatives except B also apply a buffer around occupied sites, generally 100 meters in width. This buffer is intended to add protection for nesting birds from predation, noise, wind events, and other types of disturbance. The action alternatives replace the habitat that's identified under the interim strategy with different types of conservation areas. Alternative B adds both 10,000 more acres of occupied sites and keeps the 583,000 acres of existing conservation in place. The other action alternatives add the same occupied sites plus additional types of conservation areas. These include large marble murrelet management areas that were first suggested in a 2008 science team report done by DNR. These areas are applied by alternative F only. Emphasis areas, which are a new concept where a large area of both habitat and non-habitat would be conserved for murrelet protection are applied under alternative C and E. They would allow some ongoing forest management, but also provide enhanced protection of occupied sites and other habitat within their borders. Special habitat areas are generally smaller than emphasis areas, and nearly all forest management and other land use activities like roads or trails would be prohibited there. Patches of high quality habitat which are identified with the P-stage model I talked about, are scattered throughout the analysis area and are protected under alternative C and E. Alternative F further adds lands that are currently considered low-quality northern spotted owl habitat. Definitions of all these areas and the conservation measures that go with them can be found in the DEIS. Maps of where these areas can be found are both in the DEIS and in our companion tool called a story map, which is on our website and allows you to zoom in and zoom out of certain areas of interest to you. And you can compare how all of the alternatives address landscape. Here is a screenshot from the story map tool of one of the areas I'm talking about. In this shot, the gray area of DNR managed land is in Wakayakup County. Green represents the existing conservation that DNR has for the forest lands in this block of land. Dark blue is occupied sites and their buffers, if any. Orange represents additional murrelet specific habitat that would be protected under the strategy. And the outlines define the boundaries of management areas within which different conservation measures would apply. Here's another example from Whatcom County where you can see how the different alternatives propose to manage the same block of land. You can see these same types of side-by-side -side images and the legends that go with them on our website using our story map tool. The purpose of an environmental impact statement is to compare a set of reasonable alternatives to each other and to analyze the environmental impacts that these alternatives might have on elements of the environment. I'm going to briefly discuss what we focus in on in analyzing these impacts and what a few of the major results are. We considered impacts to both natural and human resources. Those of you who are used to working with the state's SEPA requirement might be surprised to see environmental justice and socioeconomics listed here. These topics are required to be evaluated under the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, because this project relates to a federal permit. There are many ways to evaluate the effects of a proposal, and the DEIS is clear about the metrics and assumptions we use to get to our conclusions. I'm going to highlight a couple of areas where we found some clear distinctions among the alternatives. For most of our affected environment, we only found small or moderate impacts or no impacts at all. This is because the alternatives don't fundamentally change DNR's forest management practices, our regulations, or conservation strategies that are already in place to protect things like soils, aquatic resources, cultural resources. All of these alternatives add new areas of conservation to the landscape and will result in more structurally complex forests developing over time. And this has benefits for other wildlife species and other natural resources. 
There are some localized impacts to recreation and activities related to road building because of the limits that some alternatives would put on newer expanded roads, trails, and campgrounds in marbled mirrorlet habitat. In general, these impacts are not widespread or particularly adverse. There are, however, pronounced differences in the amount of habitat conservation offered under the alternatives and the effects of these changes on both the marbled mirrorlet population and local economies. First, I want to make sure that everyone can see that every alternative would grow new habitat over the course of the next 50 years. This chart shows this comparative growth. If we only look at the amount of total marble mural habitat conservation that would result from each proposal, the action alternatives can be ranked like this in comparison with alternative A, our no action alternative. Alternative B has the lowest number of acres of total conservation, and even though it adds 10,000 new acres of occupied sites to the landscape, it does not include buffers, and it removes current protections on some of the land conserved under the interim strategy. So alternative B actually ends up with slightly less total conservation than alternative A, our no action alternative. D is next, followed very closely by C through E, and finally F, which has significantly more acres of total conservation included than the other alternatives. But important for our HCP and our incidental take permit application is to understand not just how many acres of conservation we are providing, but how those acres compare to the acres of incidental take we can expect over the next 50 years through the use and management of these forests. When we stack the total habitat acres that would be conserved and grown under each strategy proposed against the acres of the potential impact DNR will have through time for forest management activities, we see this comparison. To do this calculation, DNR and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service didn't value every acre of habitat the same. For example, one acre of high-quality habitat, which is currently occupied, surrounded by mature forests close to marine waters, is worth more than an acre of habitat that may develop 20 years down the road, farther from marine waters and surrounded by younger forests. We incorporated the quality of acres when we ran our calculations for how much take and how much mitigation to expect under each alternative. Whenever you see the term adjusted acres, keep this in mind. In the appendices to the DEIS, you will find a detailed description of this adjustment process. As I said before, these results are just one way to compare the alternatives. Another would be to compare their potential effects on revenues to our trust beneficiaries, schools and counties. If we take all of the same information we have about the acres of habitat proposed for conservation and measure potential impacts to the state trusts and local counties, the rank order is very different. Alternative B is the only alternative that nets out a positive revenue compared with the no action alternative. All of the other alternatives would result in less revenue to the trust beneficiaries, with some trusts and counties being more adversely affected than others. Estimated impacts to revenues for trusts or counties was measured using assumptions about bare land value and timber sales values, and these assumptions are explained in the DEIS. It's important to note that the Marble Murillette DEIS looks only at assumed changes to harvestable acres that are related to murillette conservation. In reality, how much timber volume is available for harvest is influenced by other factors, which are more fully described in another project we have going on right now, our sustainable harvest calculation. Now that I've told you all about what's in our draft environmental impact statement, I want to let you know how you can be a part of the decision-making process. The EIS process is one of many steps. We completed our scoping and our draft and are now collecting your comments. After we share that information with the Board of Natural Resources, the Board will choose a preferred alternative and issue a final EIS that contains our responses to your comments and any changes we made to our environmental analysis. We will work on this together with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Only after this EIS process concludes does the approval process for putting a long-term strategy into place commence. The first step of the approval process is that the Board of Natural Resources must submit a formal application to amend its habitat conservation plan and incidental take permit to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service then must write its findings, write a biological opinion, and publish a record of decision about the application. Then the Board of Natural Resources decides whether to adopt the long-term strategy under the terms of the amended incidental take permit. So we have a ways to go, but right now we're in a critical step in this journey, which is sharing our ideas with you and getting your comments back. So I'm going to leave this slide up for a little bit. It tells you where and when to comment. All of this information is also available on our website and in the draft environmental impact statement itself.
So I want to talk a little bit about the types of comments that would be most helpful to our process. We read every single comment, we track them, we create lists of them, we write responses to them for our final environmental impact statement. The comments that we've found in past projects that are most useful, and this list is right out of the state's environmental policy handbook, are those that point out mistakes we might have made, things we didn't consider, pieces of information we could add, things you particularly like or dislike, and why. The why is really important. If you could be specific about why you like or don't like aspects of the alternative, or you have issues with a characterization of impacts, we want ideas about paths to solving the problems you raise. If you can organize your comments around a clear topic or topics so we can easily get to the gist of what you're focused on, it's super helpful. If we get hundreds of comments, which we might, this really helps us do a good job in responding to and making meaningful changes to our analysis or the alternatives for the final EIS. Everything I've said this afternoon and a whole lot more is available on our website. And here's the address, dnr.wa.gov slash mmltcs. Can someone submit more than one comment? Absolutely. We've already had commenters send us in postcards and letters. Um, some commenters attended our public meeting and supplied a comment there and then followed up with a letter. That's completely acceptable and we'd love to see it. We have another question from someone which is, how is climate change addressed in the DEIS? We do have a chapter that looks specifically at climate impacts. We did not find significant impacts here because we are growing more and more structurally complex forests over time. But the details of that I'm going to have to leave to the EIS itself, and you'll find it in chapters three and four under the climate section. We have another question. The question is, when will harvesting occur within the 50-year plan? So DNR will continue to harvest its forests within the next 50 years when the long-term strategy will be in place. The long-term strategy will tell us where we can do that harvest. There is also information in the DEIS that explains the number of acres under each strategy, which is anticipated to be harvested, that are considered potential marble murelet habitat. And you can read about those acres in Chapter 4 under the Marble Murelet section. This question is, are there projections about how each alternative will increase the marble murelet population? We have information in Chapter 4 of the DEIS that shows the results of a population viability analysis that the DNR hired consultants out of the University of Wisconsin to do for us, and their entire paper is in the appendix of the DEIS. But this population viability analysis tested several scenarios against the alternatives to see how habitat conservation would affect the marble murelet population. There is a basic situation where the marble murelet population is in a state of decline, and some of these scenarios show that over the course of 50 years, the conservation strategies proposed will affect that rate of decline positively. And in some cases, the population of marble murelets may increase past their starting point in terms of what was tested in the population viability analysis. But there are several other scenarios that have been tested. And if you look in Appendix C, you can find the population viability analysis and its results. And you can read for yourself how the population are projected to be affected. Here's a question that is, do the DEIS alternatives consider the increase of forest resilience to new disturbances like wildfire and climate change? I think our cumulative effects chapter looks at how the forest may change and takes into account both historic and future assumptions about disturbances like wildfire and climate change. Off the top of my head, I can't go into detail about that, but I do invite you to read chapter five, which is our cumulative effects chapter in the DEIS. I think we have a question now that I'm going to hand it over to my colleague from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Vince Harkey, to answer. This question is, is there a chart that compares U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service federal rule regarding acres of critical habitat and the DNR proposed alternatives? And the answer to that is no, we do not have an analysis of critical habitat included in the draft environmental impact statement. And that is because the critical habitat rule for the marble murelet is not applicable to 
the Department of Natural Resources lands. As long as DNR has an active HCP for marble murrelets, the critical habitat designation is, does not apply. Here's a question. Do any of the alternatives address management strategies to work with local Native American tribes as their usual and accustomed areas could cover areas dated under the DNR trust lands? We do have a chapter in the DEIS that talks about cultural resources and the fact that we're not changing anything about how tribes and other users typically have used cultural resources on these lands where the strategy would apply. And we do not have any management restrictions around those resources specifically tied to any of the strategies covered in the DEIS. I'm not sure if that fully answers the question, but we can ponder that and we can probably answer that in our final EIS. And we will incorporate it into our comments received, or you can send a comment if I don't fully answer your question, I want to encourage you to submit a comment via our comment information on the website so that we can incorporate it into our final EIS and respond to it fully because we do want to respond. Comments are due March 9th by 5 p.m. And they're written comments and you can submit them via email or you can submit them via snail mail. And now we have a question. Does the uplisting of the marble murrelet to endangered by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife in impact the DEIS. I'm going to let Mark Ostwald from U.S. Fish and Wildlife take that question. No, the state listing doesn't have any influence on this federal DEIS. You can submit as many comments as you like. We look forward to receiving all of those. Thank you for your participation and your questions. And again, if you have further questions or comments, do submit them to us by March 9th at 5 p.m. This concludes the webinar for the Marble Murillet Long-Term Conservation Strategy. Thanks for tuning in. I hope that the information will help you understand this project and this process and how you can be a part of it.